Libraries gave us power and let there be light proclaim the doorways above many of our great Victorian libraries. But what of earlier versions of these great pockets of utopia? One such place lies here, nestled in deepest Lanarkshire. Well, the village of Lead Hills is here because of the lead mining activity that took place from the Middle Ages onwards, but it was organised on a large industrial scale from the late 17th century, and things changed in 1734 when a new mine manager, James Stirling, was appointed. He brought in a school teacher and a doctor, introduced a pension scheme for the workers, increased their wages and reduced their working hours. He was really Robert Owen 60 years, 60 years before Robert Owen and it was in that sort of environment that the library was founded. We don't know exactly who founded it because the, the records don't survive, but we do know it's the oldest subscription library in Britain and it's the world's first library for working people. Can you explain this principle of mutual improvement that seems to have been so integral to the library? First of all, this area was historically an area linked with the Covenanters, and the Covenanters were great Bible readers, so that encouraged right. literacy, and that took them on to read other books, initially books about religion and then books about history and uh, a wider range of social subjects. But the other explanation would be James Sterling's introduction of a school teacher to the village who would make sure that there were high levels of literacy. Um, do you have evidence of visitors coming and being impressed by this? Oh yes, yes, there's various visitors over the years. Uh, the best known one is Dorothy Wordsworth who passed through here with her brother at the beginning of the, the 19th century. But unfortunately the library was shut, she wasn't able to get in. John, we have all these books which are portals of history in themselves, but also these artefacts dotted around the place that tell the history of the, of, of the library. What is in this case here? Um, every new member when he joined was issued with a membership certificate and we've got two examples here and if you look above you you'll see the engraving plates, the copper engraving plates that were used to print them and in the middle we also have the engraving plate of the library book plate which was pasted into every book. Inside so the jacket, yeah, it's a beautiful indeed. thing. Mm -hmm. It brings the question really of how the books came to be here, how they were physically purchased because of course books were so expensive in those days. Was it all through the subscription or other people putting money in? Well, it was, it was partly through subscriptions and the, the cost of books is one of the reasons why these libraries were founded because people couldn't afford to buy many books of their own. So subscriptions were one of the ways of doing it, but local people would also donate items to the stock as well. And our, our earliest a title was published in 1673. The library wasn't founded until 1741, so it was probably a donation. Now, John, in between A Tramp Abroad and a three-part life of W.E. Gladstone is this peculiar-looking um, sort of crimson box. Can you describe to me what this is? Well, it's a ballot box with a, a hole in the top, and uh, the box would have contained black balls and white balls, and when a prospective member applied for membership, the existing members would vote on whether to admit him. A white ball would indicate acceptance and a black ball would indicate rejection, but I haven't come across any evidence that anybody was ever no. rejected. It'd be quite a devastating thing for me anyway. <laughs> well, especially in a local community like yeah. this, you can imagine the shame. Mm -hmm. <laughs>